Uh, Acts chapter 8, if you would please stand in honor of God's word. And Saul was consenting unto his, Stephen, the deacon's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, uh, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house, hauling men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you'll give us that missionary spirit, that heart to spread your glorious gospel. Lord, we love you. We thank you that the fields are indeed white unto harvest. And God, you've said that we should be praying for laborers, and that's what we ask for. God, that you will give us folks to, to teach more Sunday school classes, to, to, to do more outreach, to, to help teach our RAs and GAs and mission friends, and to, to be table mentors for our youth. And, and Lord Jesus, there are just so many things that are needed. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will just draw people to your church. We love you. I pray that you will give us wisdom tonight as we look at this scripture. And we will give you glory and honor, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The death of Stephen, the first deacon, uh, triggered a lot of events that I think are very interesting. We need to look at for just a second. Uh, first of all, up until this time, most of the book of Acts is centered around the activities of the apostles and the church located at First Baptist Church in Jerusalem. Okay, So most of, up until now, Acts has been centered around this very, very small bubble, all right? But a shift is going to take place. And the focus of the book of Acts is going to change from Jerusalem. Now we're going to go out to Samaria, Judea, to the rest of the world. To literally trying to evangelize the Roman Empire. Amen? So this is a shift in the book of Acts that, that you're going to see here. Uh, second... The death of Stephen triggered a greater persecution. Uh, it was almost like the Jewish leaders, in a fit of rage, stoned this seemingly unimportant Christian. See, they, they were about half scared of the apostles, but, but here was a layman. Here was a deacon in the church, and uh, how dare he preach to them like that? How dare he try to change their mind or correct them as far as doctrine was concerned or about the Messiah. They had seminary degrees. They were smart. They've been doing this a long time. They were leaders of the Jewish nation. How dare Stephen be uppity and try to teach them something. And, and I think that in their, their uh, fit of rage, I think as they were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that this was not a pre-planned event as I believe the execution and crucifixion of Jesus was. I, I, I think this was just a spur of the moment event that they got so angry, so mad that they decided we're going to take matters into our own hands and we're going to take you outside the city walls and we're going to stone you, buddy. We're going to stone you. Now understand something. The right of execution in the Roman Empire belonged to Rome. Did not belong to the Jews. That's why they took Jesus to Pontius Pilate because they didn't have the right. He said, take him out and do him by your own life. They said, this is a capital offense. We can't do that. So now they've taken out one of their own and they've killed him. They've stoned him without the permission of Rome. And I believe that the Jewish leaders are just waiting for the wrath of Rome to come crashing down on their heads, but the rebuke from Rome never came. Rome did nothing. Pontius Pilate had had enough of the Jews. Let them kill each other for all he cared. That politician was only interested in staying in power. The less problem he had, the better he liked it. Who cared about Stephen anyway? Let him take him out and kill him. When they were able to kill Stephen, 
without any repercussions, this emboldened the Jewish leaders greatly. And the Bible says it began an even greater persecution under the leadership of this Hellenistic Jew by the name of Saul of Tarsus, who would become Paul the Apostle. So listen to verse 3 because the Bible says, And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. He entered into every house and hauling men and women and committed them to prison. In other words, brother, he was going door to door looking for them. And if he found a Christian or any evidence that you were a Christian, he would haul you out and throw you into jail. The word that they use in the Greek language, he made havoc of the church, is only used here in the New Testament. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. But in classic Greek literature, what it means is it would be the same term that if you went to a city as an army and destroyed that city, you would make havoc of that city. You would destroy that city. That's the word that's used. He was bent on destroying the church. It's, it's the same word that would be used if a wild animal attacked you and tried to tear you to pieces. It would be making havoc of you. He was an enraged, very angry, wild person that was trying his very best to destroy the church. And he went about the task of arresting men and women and throwing them in jail for simply believing in Jesus. That's all they had. That was the only qualification. You're a Christian. You're going to jail. We're going to put you in jail. You believe in Jesus. Now, I want you to understand something. I, I do not believe that I am a prophet that foretells the future. I do believe I, I, I preach prophetic messages that foretell truth, that, that foretell truth. But I do not foretell the future. You understand the difference? Amen? But as a man of God that studies the word of God, I do see a great persecution coming to the church in our land. I think the winds of our society have so changed that Bible-believing, practicing Christians are now in the great minority. We are no longer in the majority. Details about this persecution that I believe possibly we could be coming, since we're looking at persecution of the church in Acts chapter 8, I think this persecution will come suddenly, just like in the book of Acts. I don't think there's going to be great preparation for it. The anti-Bible-believing LBGTQXYZ crowd of heretics <laughs> will eventually find the right case, and when they win it, and no one comes to the Christian's rescue nor stands up for them, you will see the persecution begin exponentially in our country. A great example of probing our defenses, the homosexual couple that sued a bakery for refusing to bake a wedding cake for, with two homos on top. Now listen, anybody with bad sense would say, just go bake your own cake or find somebody else to do it. But that's not what they did because it was a planned event. A lot of money and effort went into testing the waters of how far can we go? Can we make a business do what we want the business to do simply because we are of a homosexual sexual relationship? So we ask such questions as, and these are questions that are being asked now in society and in the courtroom. Do Christian organizations have the right to deny employment to a person living in a sinful relationship or what we believe the Bible teaches is a sinful relationship? In other words, if we have a staff position open and somebody comes up and says, listen, I'm a man and I'm living with another man and we're, we're in a relationship, we're going to get married and, and I'm applying for the student minister of this church. And we say, listen, you don't, you don't qualify. Can we disqualify them based upon their sexual orientation? Those cases are being tested in the court right now. And then you get to the point of asking the question, is a church even teaching a homosexual relationship as sin, teaching a hate crime? Do schools have the right to teach that sodomy and homosexual relationships are wrong? Can schools pray at a football game or an assembly or at the poll? Because I'm telling you, listen to me. If you were born in the 60s and the 50s and you went to school at that time, school's a different beast now. And we're also semi-isolated here in East Texas 
And brother, you get outside this buckle of the Bible belt and it gets worse and worse as you get further and further away. And now the case comes, how late can we actually kill a child and still call it abortion? Why do you think they're doing that? They're testing the resolve of the church. They're testing the resolve of the courts. They're testing to see if any politician will come and stand beside Christians. And if it's politically incorrect, don't be looking for them because they're not going to be there. I'm telling you, we're being set up by the atheists, by the abortionists, by the liberal religious institutions. And when persecution begins, it will come quickly. They're, they're waiting to see if Rome's going to come down. We stone the Christian. Are we going to get in trouble? No, we didn't get in trouble. Good. Now, let's attack. And when persecution comes, it will come very quickly. Persecution, I believe, the second thing, will lead to a great falling away of believers in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, that's, that's what I believe our times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and, and know the truth. You're going to have people saying, oh, well, we, we care more about uh, 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 the life of a cow than we do the life of a baby. You can't eat that meat. That's bad. Don't do that. And you're going to find a falling away from the church in the latter times and giving heed to seducing spirits. We would rather stay home and watch television than come and worship in God's house. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, the day of the Lord, the day in which Jesus comes back for the church, uh, shall not come except there come a falling away first. The word they're used is an apostasy, a leaving from the faith. It's not that they'll cease being religion, religious, but brother, they're going to leave the faith. That the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This was predicted not only by Paul to the church at Thessalonica, but also Jesus in the Olivet Discourse and also in the book of Daniel. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says the same thing as he's giving signs of the last days. He says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. And it's literally saying within the church. And shall hate one another and many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I don't love you anymore. And the love within the church body will wax cold. He says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Daniel chapter 7 declares that the Antichrist will declare war on the saints and will prevail against them. And then it goes on to say in Daniel 7, 25, and he, the Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. You may not think you've got an enemy, but I've got news for you. The devil's declared war on you. And he's just looking for the right opportunity to come at you, fangs bared, and to make havoc of the church. If indeed we are the generation that will see the return of our Lord, I believe we can expect not only sudden persecution, but that that sudden persecution will lead to a great falling away and will continue in ferocious persecution in which many people will lose their lives. I think this chain reaction will now lead to a sudden interest in church members going on mission trips. So uh, Stephen now dies, and persecution begins suddenly within the church at Acts, and, and, and the result is 
the missions committee at First Baptist Church Jerusalem gets really, really busy because suddenly everybody's interested in going on mission trips. In other words, they're interested in leaving Jerusalem and going anywhere. Amen. Listen to Acts 8 4. Therefore, because of this persecution, because it was starting to get uncomfortable, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. The mission trip participation at First Baptist Church Jerusalem went from three to 300 overnight. If the church was not going to fulfill the Great Commission willingly, then God would have to give them a little nudge. And that's exactly what he did. Listen to me. Here's our great hope. That God's still on the throne and he is in control. You say, well, well, Stephen died. Oh, no, I guess you know. No, 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 no. He looked up. Heaven opened up. God's still on the throne. He's still there. He's still in charge. And we asked the question, then couldn't he have stopped this execution of Stephen, his beloved deacon? Yes, he could have. He sure could have. He could have stopped it right then and there and returned and set up his kingdom, but he chose not to. And he allowed the tragedy to take place. And, and Paul will later write and say, but we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose. Even something as tragic as Stephen being stoned. God would take this tragedy and turn it into something good. Joseph in the Old Testament was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was falsely accused by the wife of Potiphar and literally forgotten, put into a jail cell and forgotten by Pharaoh. Later, he would be vindicated and, and this is what he would tell his brothers. Joseph, when confronted with his brothers who sold him into slavery and, and, and had left him for dead, this is what he told them. He said, but as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. God used your dirty deed for something great and as a result, many people are going to be saved alive because God can take the worst of situations and turn them into the best. In the 8th chapter of Acts, a multitude of people will get saved in Samaria. The Bible says that, that Philip will go there and, 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 a, and a revival breaks out. Miracles taking place. Man, it's so exciting in Samaria. And, and, and it's interesting because it's say. Uh, he, he went uh, down to Samaria, but Samaria is actually north of there. And, but you understand, as far as the Bible is concerned, anything leaving Jerusalem is going down, no matter which direction you went. And so many people are being one to the Lord that literally the apostles say, somebody's got to go check this thing out. We weren't even sure that Samaritans could get saved. And Philip's gone there and there, and he started a revival. And man, we got to do something about this. The revival was triggered by the death of Stephen. I believe the conviction in Saul's heart to become Paul the apostle was begun in seeing the death of Stephen and how he died. I believe that the revival that takes place in Samaria in Acts chapter 8 is but one example of literally hundreds of revivals that began all around the area of Judea. This is just the one that's recorded. And literally hundreds of thousands of people begin to get saved as a result of missionaries moving out and spreading the gospel triggered by the death of Stephen. On Sunday, January the 8th of 1956, on the banks of a lonely river in the Ecuadorian jungle, five young men were murdered by the Aka Indians. They had flown in in a small airplane. They were missionaries. They simply wanted to share the gospel with this primitive tribe. Five young men, they left behind five young widows and several children that would not have a father. Among those young men was a young man named Jim Elliott. For years, I kept a quote in my billfold. Uh, it's on my wall in my office that says, he is no fool who loses what he cannot keep in order to keep that which he cannot lose. Jim Elliott gave his very life for the cause of Christ. 
You may say, well, what a waste, what a waste. But Elizabeth Elliot was able to write a book that chronicled this tragedy called Through the Gates of Splendor, Through the Gates of Splendor. And, 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 and this is what she wrote, the result of the death of these five young men. To the world at large, this was a sad waste of five young lives. But God has his plan and purpose in all things. There were those whose lives were changed by what happened in Palm Beach. In Brazil, a group of Indians at a mission station deep in the Mato Grosso, upon hearing the news, dropped to their knees and cried out to God to forgiveness for their own lack of concern for their fellow Indians who did not know Jesus Christ. From Rome, an American official wrote to one of the widows, I knew your husband. He was to me the ideal of what a Christian should be. An American Air Force major stationed in England with many hours of jet flying time immediately began plans to join the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. There was a missionary in Africa that wrote, Our work will never be the same. We knew two of those men. Their lives have left their mark on ours. Off the coast of Italy, an American naval officer was involved in an accident at sea. As he floated alone on a raft, he recalled Jim Elliott's words, which he'd read in a news report that said, when it comes time to die, make sure that all you have left to do is to die. He prayed that he might be saved knowing he had more to do than to die. He was not, answer, he was not ready to die. God answered his prayer and he was rescued. In Des Moines, Iowa, an 18-year-old boy prayed for a week in his room then announced to his parents, I'm turning my life over completely to the Lord. I want to try to take the place of one of those five. This past week, we've seen a great, horrible tragedy in our church. Why did it happen? I do not know. But if somebody's life was touched, if somebody was saved, if somebody was called to the ministry, if somebody said, listen, it's time for me to understand the brevity of life, I've always assumed I would have tomorrow when God's never guaranteed me tomorrow. Maybe it's time that I begin to appreciate my parents today. Maybe it's time I begin to appreciate my husband or my wife today. Because God's never guaranteed me tomorrow. Why do we have tragedies? I do not know, but I, this I do know. That all things work to the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus Christ, and God, I thank you for the testimony and the life of this wonderful, magnificent deacon by the name of Stephen. God, I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you could have stopped that, but you chose not to. Instead, Lord Jesus, you stood in his honor and you welcomed him into the gates of heaven. Oh, God, would you give us a missionary spirit? The desire to go forth and tell the nations, and not because we're being persecuted, but because you've called us. Because you've said those fields are white unto harvest. God, would you use us as great prayer warriors? If we can't go on those mission trips, can we support those mission trips? Lord Jesus, would you please help us to number our days and to realize we don't have forever. We have this small window of time to do your bidding, and I pray, oh God, that we would do it well. It's these things I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Brother Billy's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. The altar is open if God's spoken to somebody's heart. But as we begin to sing, would you come? Christians, you be praying, please. As we sing, you come.